What's going on everybody? My name is Johnny Bannon and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trevor Technologies. In today's video, we're going to be going over Security Plus SY0-701, Domain 1.2, summarizing fundamental security concepts. So in this video, we're going to go over things like the CIA triad, AAA, Zero Trust Architecture, which is going to be a big portion, probably its own video, and then also physical security, something that's often forgot about in cybersecurity. If you like these videos, please feel free to like and subscribe and share with your friends so they can get some awesome CompTIA Security Plus training. Now, let's go ahead and get started. So let me get my face out of here. So we're going over Domain 1.2, Summarize Fundamental Security Concepts. And the objectives we're going to hit in this video are going to be the CIA triad, which is the fundamentals of anything cybersecurity. Whether you go to a 100 level course in college or whether you're actually implementing cybersecurity solutions, this is something that often gets referred back to or called back on when implementing solutions in the security realm or the cybersecurity realm. Then we're going to go over AAA, that's authenticating people, authenticating systems and the authorization models, and then also what the acronym means and kind of defining each one of those A's, authentication, authorization, accounting. And then we're going to get into the zero trust architecture. So this is going to be another big one. And the reason this is a big one is because it is a lot more in depth than 601 was as far as explaining zero trust architecture, getting into the different ways we could possibly implement it and the different terms here. So we're actually going to define the control plane and data plane, and we're actually going to take a look at NIST 800-207, which is the NIST standard for zero trust architecture, which CompT Security Plus took uh, that NIST framework and is now testing you on it. So this control plane, all these solutions, you're going to notice when you look at that NIST document about zero trust architecture, it's verbatim the same thing. So if you read that, then you'll definitely be good to go for the exam. Well, you should be good to go for the exam when talking about zero trust. And then, of course, we're going to go over deceptive and disruption technologies and also physical security, which isn't on the objectives, but that's okay. That is part of our domain 1.2 uh, curriculum. So let's start off going over the CIA triad. So the CIA triad, it's going to stand for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So these three core principles, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, they work together in tandem to deliver cybersecurity solutions. And they are the principles that form the foundation for securing information and systems on your enterprise. As cybersecurity professionals, we have a couple different roles to play. Obviously, our main one is going to be securing the enterprise, securing your customer's data, securing your user's data, and just security, right? Security of the enterprise. With that, we're very technical. So most of the time, your SOC analysts, your cybersecurity engineers, they have the best technical solution to protect your environment. They want to implement SIAM or SIM or XDR and do the monitoring and actually do that active proactive threat hunting, okay? All those technical solutions. Sometimes we forget that our actual role as cybersecurity professionals is to enable business operations. We are there as anyone in tech, sometimes we forget this guys, that we're there to enable the business and to ensure it stays profitable. So why am I bringing this up and going over the CIA triad? Because if you're going through this uh, Security Plus course with me, we're here to get you certified, but I also like to put just a little bit of two cents. And my two cents as a engineer is keep it simple. Keep it simple and make sure that solution does its job while also keeping availability. So not saying that one is more important than the other here as far as confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But what happens to the engineer that just focuses on confidentiality because maybe security is actually a big effort in pushing your organization. From the top level down, top leadership down, they care about their cybersecurity and their cyber solution. So because of that, you feel empowered to maybe experiment, to maybe really harden your devices and lock down and create that great defense in depth. Well, sometimes that may lead to solutions that cause bad availability for your users to execute their task in a timely manner. So sometimes if you go too much this way, you fail on the other ones, okay? So this works together. Remember that you're there to create solutions that work for the business, that secure the enterprise, while also making so your systems stay unaltered and to make sure they actually stay available. 
And with that, we also have to think of resiliency here with availability. Integrity, we have to think about our data if it's ever compromised, how does it stay unaltered? And with confidentiality, we're gonna be looking at how we protect our data with encryption and access control methods. So now let's go ahead and jump into our next section here, going starting off going over confidentiality. So confidentiality, definition. Confidentiality ensures that sensitive information is kept private and accessible only to those authorized individuals or systems. So let's break that down, shall we? So we say that sensitive information is kept private. How can we enable that privacy? How can we enable that our data at rest or in transit, oops, transit or in use is protected? That it's not in what's called plain text where any threat actor could read our sensitive information or our data. Well, we apply encryption. That's one of the main solutions in confidentiality, applying encryption. So for our data at rest, that may be a full disk encryption solution. For in transit, I'm gonna come down here, that could be enabling TLS, doing public and private key pair algorithms and cryptography algorithms, which we're gonna get into. So enabling encryption like AES or RSA, into our TLS cipher suite. When we do VPNs or we have VPN solutions, ensuring we have encryption on top of that, okay? For data in use. So that's when data is being used by our compute resources, right? And RAM and memory. We do have ways to protect that as well. So I don't know if it's gonna be on this Security Plus exam. If you come to our CAS course, we talk about those solutions like the NX or the XN bit or the ASLR solutions that protect data in use. But that is a part of confidentiality. And then we have accessibility. So ensuring that we have something called least privilege. This is a security concept that's gonna come up. It's one of the fundamentals of cybersecurity is ensuring that users only have access to what they need to perform their duties. And this goes tenfold for consumers of whatever our digital product may be, right? If someone's going to our e-commerce website, they should be nowhere near any sort of privileges. And it goes same for our users as well. So going over the concept of least privilege, kind of in tandem with accessibility, ensuring that data or systems or architecture on an enterprise is only available to authorized users or authorized systems, okay? So accessibility plays into this. Another key concept is this need to know. This goes hand in hand with something we like to call Mac, mandatory access control, but that's on a need to know basis. So only individuals with a legitimate need to access certain information should have access. And we get into access control schemes and methods like RBAC, uh, and then we have rule-based, we have DAC, discretionary access control. This helps us ensure confidentiality. So this is kind of working twofold, right? We're ensuring we have those access control methods in place, ensuring we have these access control schemes Probably this dives into IAM as well, identity access management. So essentially just the concept of least privilege plays into all these different ways, all these different uh, concepts, right? It enables all those concepts. When you're going into your cybersecurity architecture meetings with the team, with your SOC saying, okay, we need to ensure confidentiality. We want to implement least privilege. Here's how we do it. We have good identity access management. We have people... Our users, our consumers, having a need-to-know basis to access information. We're configuring and setting up, or our engineers are setting up role-based or mandatory access control on our systems and data. And then, of course, encryption. So using encryption techniques to protect data at rest, in transit, and during processing. That's where I got the in-use, right? And if we come down here, just a quick little uh, picture of how we do encryption, right? So that plain text is gonna be human readable. Something we could see, imagine uh, this uh, girl sending an email in plain text. I can wiretap that, maybe I set up Wireshark uh, or Span or something like that. And I can see everything about that email, that's plain text. Well, once I apply that encryption algorithm with this secret key, I now turn it into ciphertext and now it's protected and now it's confidential. Now nobody even doing any wiretap or looking at that data in transit can see it, okay? 
Now, let's go over integrity. So the definition, integrity ensures the accuracy and trustworthiness of data. It guarantees that data remains unchanged by an unauthorized user or malicious parties. So what are we talking about here? So we're going to go over two main concepts. One is data validation and change management. So this is more thinking about our enterprise processes have integrity, and that's going through like our agile development process or our development process or our DevOps teams or our IT operations, IT operations teams have some sort of system or process in place that ensures that that tier one or that SOC one or that software developer uh, one can't make production level changes, right? That we have some sort of process in place that helps us make sure our data is protected from not authorized changes, okay? So that's kind of within the enterprise. Then we have data validation. So data validation employs methods like using checksums, hashing, and digital signatures to verify data integrity. What do we mean by this? What we mean is that our data remains unchanged. So let's just put this into a scenario. Let's say we have a data breach. Let's say we have a cybersecurity incident. And through our cybersecurity incident response teams and our planning, we get to the point where we have to do digital forensics. So we take our, let's say, web server here. I'm just going to put web app here. And that was the machine that has the incident on it. Now going through our order of volatility for our artifacts, we do memory dumps, we do hex uh, dumps, and we get all that volatile information. And now we're on to the actual hard drive or solid state drive itself, the image. Through that digital forensics process, we have to maintain something called the chain of custody. That's for legal reasons to make sure that the data hasn't been tampered with. Besides just that chain of custody sheet, how can we ensure that when we do a data duplication on this image here, Let's just say that's my hard drive right here. How can we make sure that it's unchanged through our chain of custody? Technically, right? Through the actual, uh, the bits. How can we make sure nothing was changed? Well, what we can do is take that image and pretend that's this input here and run it against a hash function. So let's say a SHA-256 algorithm. And when we apply that algorithm to our input, we're going to create a unique digest or sometimes called a check sum. That unique digest correlates to this unique input, okay? So in a perfect world, right, without getting into salting and extra things we can do to make sure there's no collisions, and we'll dive deeper into that. In a perfect world, this input right here, every time I apply this SHA-256 algorithm against it, should always produce this same digest. Now let's say a malicious user goes in and changes something on our image here. So using this as an example input, let's say, I'm going to clear this up. They do this and they change it. Hello world. That ain't an O no more. That's a zero. If I apply this hash function or that hashing algorithm, I should get a completely new digest, completely new. So how can we verify integrity of our data, our actual data is we can run hashing algorithms against it. And we can produce these message digests or these checksums that now you can compare. So now let's say back to our web server, it goes into our digital forensics teams. Let's say you were the first responder. So let's say you're part of the CERT team, the uh, cyber security incident response team. And you were the first one on here to isolate this. So maybe there's a worm on there that's uh, self-spreading. You are the first one to isolate. You're the SOC level one. And now the digital forensics teams come in. Now this could be like third party or whatever the case may be. And they say, okay, uh, let me see the hash you took. And you being a good SOC 1 analyst, you followed the playbook given uh, by you, given to you for your incident response planning. And that's the first thing you did when you got to the image, right? You're like, let me take a hash of this. And now let's say you produce that hash. The first thing that digital forensics team is going to do after they duplicate that image is then verify that hash again to make sure that it was unchanged between that handoff between you and them. Now, kind of going back to this change management or other examples, I should say, of verifying integrity that's not just taking hashes and being real technical is ensuring that, uh, like, well, also depending on your sector, ensuring like if you have HIPAA laws you got to abide by or data sovereignty rules that you're also maintaining dagger integrity as well. 
we're going to get into that when we talk about uh, geographical considerations like the GDPR in the EU. Not to ramble on, but again, also integrity is having good processes in place to make sure that you're not altering production environments without the proper approval. Okay, then last thing we're gonna go over in this video, so it's not too long, is availability. My favorite one to talk about. So definition, availability ensures that systems and data are accessible and operational when needed by authorized users. So kind of getting into the technical without just thinking that thinking of availability from a bird's eye view uh, before getting into the technical. This ensures that our systems are usable, right? Because sometimes we lock our systems down so much that I've worked on environments where it takes 10 minutes to log in to your computer. Now imagine you're trying to create a good environment for your workforce to think creatively, to be motivated, to uh, be excited to come into work. And the first thing they gotta do is wait for their computer to load their huge desktop profile, user profile, all the GPO settings, every single time they log in. You can imagine the kind of uh, hit on morale that's gonna take, especially on users. Because we're all human, we can be, we can have a bad weekend coming to work on Monday, and that's just the icing on the cake that makes it worse for us. So when I think availability, this is just Johnny Bannon's opinion, making systems usable. Making systems that enable the business to thrive, okay? That's availability. Now the definition, of course, uh, or the technical solutions we're going to talk about in the Security Plus exam are things like redundancy, ensuring that we don't have single points of failure. Ensuring we have redundant systems and components that can minimize downtime in case of hardware failures. So a good example of this, this image I have down here, is we could be doing app or data duplication between our different cloud regions here or zones. So you can see here, we may have apps deployed in the west, in the east, and depending where our users sit, where our users are sitting, they're gonna go to the east or the west. Now imagine if you just had this East data center operating your uh, web application or your serverless architecture, and then it goes down, which has happened to AWS in the recent years, like probably maybe, I guess three or four years ago. If you didn't have that redundancy in the West, all your users and your systems would just be SOL, right? So that's part of redundancy, and that's how the cloud can enable redundancy. You can also have that locally just in your data center if you're not thinking of catastrophic failures, like having what's called first hop redundancy protocols for your network environment, um, doing something like NIC teaming or even load balancing. That's a form of redundancy um, for distributing network traffic. It can also be just local in your data center, right? Having a primary server and a secondary server. Redundancy, we also start talking about things like hot sites, warm sites, and cold sites. Um, we'll, we'll dive deeper into this when we go over the cloud. We also want to think of an acronym called COOP. So when we have an enterprise that we work on that may be sitting in a natural disaster zone, first thing that comes to mind is big data centers in like Florida. Once a year, you're going to bet that maybe your data center will come down to do environmental concerns. So this, the continuity of operations, is something you probably plan for yearly, and that's having that secondary data center that can take over for potentially your primary one that sits in that natural disaster zone, Okay. So that's redundancy at a bigger level. It could also be smaller. It could just be you having an ups in your small office, right? An uninterruptible power supply. Load balancing. This is going to distribute network traffic evenly to prevent overloads and ensure responsiveness. So this protects us from things like denial of service attacks. This also uh, protects us just from a large influx of users. So an example that always comes to mind is when you run an e-commerce site, when is your peak time more than likely going to be around the holidays, Christmas, and as of this recording, January 1st, it just happened, right? So fresh in the mind. It would be probably beneficial to put a load balancer in line with your web server farm here that can distribute all those inbound connections uh, maybe evenly or doing some sort of scheduling algorithm, right? That just protects you, that ensures high availability for those users. And then, of course, disaster recovery is something you got to think about. Now, this is just at a high level, right? We're gonna dive into all the different disaster recovery concepts and techniques we have, but this is just develop plans for data backup, recovery, and continuity in the event of disruptions. This could be from natural disasters. 
This could be from a cybersecurity related incident. This could be just from a straight up hardware failure, okay? So how are we planning? How are we backing up data? Are we doing full backups, incremental, differential? Do we have RAID applied on our on-premise? If we live in a hybrid architecture, do we need our data center in cloud to be up to support that hybrid environment? Or are they split offs, right? Something we just have to think about when talking about availability. All right, guys, that's gonna be it for the lecture portion. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to bring up a quiz questions. So go ahead and pause the video right now if you need to take a little break. I'm gonna bring up our quiz questions and let's go over them. So here we're on our Academy site and on our Academy site, we're gonna go over our quiz software essentially. Let me bring this good into view. And we're gonna go over the CIA triad. So what I want you to do for this portion of our videos is just, I'm gonna read the question off, I'm gonna answer. I want you to pause before I answer, try to answer yourself, and then we'll go over the explanation. So when you purchase our course on our website, you get all this available to you. These are just little quizzes that I put together for this video course on YouTube and will eventually go on Udemy. But you actually get thousands of practice questions available to you when you purchase our course from trepatech.com. All right, enough of the sales, let's do this. So now let's do some verification of what we just learned. So question one, in the context of the CIA triad, what does confidentiality primarily ensure? So we have four options here. I'm gonna go with C, data is protected from unauthorized access or disclosure. All right, awesome, we see our explanation here. So confidentiality in the CIA triad refers to the protection of data from unauthorized or access disclosure. The goal is to ensure that sensitive information is accessible only to those who have the right to view it. Awesome, next question. What aspect of the CIA triad is pr primarily concerned with ensuring that data and resources are available to authorized users when needed? So I just know this is always gonna be availability and we have our explanation down here. So this aspect of the CIA triad focuses on reliable access to data and resources, which is crucial for the smooth functioning of any organization. So when you do these questions on our site, guys, you always get this explanation, even if you hit the wrong answer. So let me hit the wrong answer and you can see here, right? So let's go over this now. Which of the following best describes integrity in the CIA triad? That's going to be preserving the accuracy and completeness of data. So this means that data should not be improperly modified, either maliciously or accidentally, and should remain intact, consistent, and accurate. All right, everybody. So I want to thank you for joining me on this video. Stay tuned for our next video. We're going to continue with our obje objectives going over triple A. That's going to be authentication, authorization, and accounting. And then after that, we'll probably get into the zero trust architecture and then try to wrap up domain 1.2. So I want to thank you all for viewing. And if you're ever interested in some free training, if you're an active duty reserve or National Guard soldier, hit that link in the bio below or in the description below to see how you can get Army Credentialing Assistance Funding, and get your certification, boot camps, self-paced training, live virtual training for free from the benefits that you've earned with the 4000 a year. So thank you for viewing and feel free to like and subscribe.